All right, there we go. Okay, we are recording. So Got it. I'm going to share my screen. I'll start from the beginning here again. Thanks. So, again, you had all these really wealthy individuals, the Ray Crocs and McDonald's, the Vanderbilts, uh, the, the Rockefellers, uh, Walt Disney, and they were parking millions of dollars in these things called single premium insurance. And, and again, you can Google BOLI, which is B-O-L-I, Bank Owned Life Insurance. Banks actually park billions of dollars in their tier one capital in life insurance. But these guys would go to the insurance carrier and they would say, hey, I need $5 million uh, of life insurance. The carrier would come back and say, we'll give you $5,100,000 of death benefit. They didn't do it for life insurance. They did it because it was a tax shelter. Because when you park money with life insurance, you get these amazing attributes. You get guaranteed rates of return. You have liquidity. You're in real estate. You understand how litigious society is. You can The, the creditor protection on these things. Uh, all the growth is tax-free. And then kind of the straw that stirs the drink, the thing you mentioned a minute ago, is you have uninterrupted compound interest. So even when you access the money, and I'll show you how this works, your dollar continues to grow and compound as if the money never left. So these wealthy cats understood that. They knew that single premium insurance was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, unfortunately, like he always does, Uncle Sam kind of comes along and says, look, you guys aren't breaking the law, but you're not using life insurance for life insurance. You're using it as a tax shelter. So he goes and draws this line in the sand. It's called the modified endowment contract line or this MEC line. And basically what that says is that if you have access to too much capital in year one or, or too much liquidity, we are going to deem that a modified endowment contract and the growth is going to be taxable. So this is where, in my opinion, I think the insurance industry gets a bad reputation is they go the whole other side of the spectrum here where it's everything is high death benefit, which equals high profits to the insurance company and then candidly higher commissions to the insurance agent. And so those are things like term and all these variable or index universal life policies and even traditional whole life policy. Well, thankfully, this dude named Nelson Nash comes along and discovers that you can take whole life, strip out the cost which is by reducing the death benefit because that's where the cost is. And you basically have all the same single premium insurance attributes, but you're just on the right-hand side of this MEC line. Does that make sense? So everything is tax-free at that point because we're shaving up right next to the MEC line. Does that make sense? You're on mute. Is that a certain dollar amount? Uh, no, it's not a dollar amount. It's a ratio, and I'll explain this. So, so but, but I'm saying I want to make sure that that makes sense since as to how the policy came into being structured or created or, or discovered. So we're trying to basically get to single premium insurance, but we're trying to stay on the right-hand side of the MEC line. Does that follow, okay. follow that? Okay. So we're not using term because essentially term insurance is a straight up expense. It's dollar for every single dollar that you send is going simply to death benefit. And then the closer that we get to single premium insurance, we start sending more money to cash value and less money to death benefit. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So then what happens is let's just use, let's use $90,000 for an example. Well, now let's use this one. Let's use 200,000 because I've already used this example. Again, let's take off a zero if we wanted to. I can take a zero off this thing. So it's 20,000. And again, this, this doesn't have to necessarily describe you at all. But this is, um, again, we can add a zero, we can take off a zero. The ratios of every policy are the same. So let's say that you were going to make a $20,000 deposit into your infinite banking policy account, essentially, okay? Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to move our money, which is our left pocket, which is a taxable or tax deferred account, and let's shift them over into our tax free account. That's the whole point. That's the, the main driver. Because once we understand the problem that taxes will go up in the future just because of the unfunded liabilities coming on the books, basically Uncle Sam has made too many promises, has printed too much money. So our goal needs to be moving our money out of uh, anything that's exposed to uh, being sued and also exposed to taxation. That's our goal here by moving it over here. But in year one, let me show you how this number is split up. You make a $20,000 deposit, and this is only in year one. You have about 60% cash value in year one. That's 12 grand. The $8,000 or that 40% 
we have to go by death benefit. That's the smallest amount that we can send each and every year is to death benefit. And so um, the reason why we do that is because if you, you understand real estate, you understand what a home equity line of credit is. When you go and make your mortgage payments, you're building equity in your home. I want to compare this to like a HELOC. When you make your mortgage payments to the bank, you build equity each and every month in your property or in your home. And then you want to go put a new kitchen in. You want to maybe put a deck on your house. You borrow $20,000 from the equity of your home. And so what the bank does, as you know, is they slap a lien on your property, right? It's a, or a second mortgage, or you want to call that. Well, that's the, the asset to the bank is your home or the real estate. Well, in life insurance, the asset to the life insurance company is the death benefit. That's the asset. So I want you to compare those two the same way. Banks look at real estate as the asset. Life insurance use death benefit as the asset. The cash value is like your equity that you're building up in your home. Same thing in your pro in your policy. Is that kind of is that congruent? Uh, a little bit. So I'm a little bit caught up on like because the death benefit is a dollar is a monetary value. It's not tangible. It's um, something that's just kind of. You know, I'll keep going. I wanted to make sure that at least where yeah. I'll, I'll show you the numbers. I just wanted to make okay. make that correlation between the assets, sure. like the, the cash value in your policy is like the equity in your home and the asset to the line of credit, if you will, is the death benefit or your real estate. So okay. I wanted to say this $8,000 of this base premium has to go purchase death benefit in the very first year. That's your illiquidity in year one. Okay. Okay. So now let's just go down. Let me show you exactly how, um, let me show you how like <clears throat> your money continues to earn uninterrupted compounding. So same thing like in your HELOC, when you keep making your deposits and you, you borrow against the equity, that's not going to interrupt the appreciation of your home. I mean, we hope, let's just assume that houses just continue to go up, you know, whatever. Um, over time, house, the housing market has gone up. So we'll just use that as an example. But when you borrow against the equity, that doesn't interrupt the appreciation of your home. So it's almost the same way here. So when you will go and borrow from your policy or you borrow from the equity in your cash value, that's not interrupting the growth of your cash value. Because what they do, if you look here, when you sent that initial amount of money to death benefit, that base premium that purchased this asset over here, what you're going to do if you've, and again, this is down the road, let's say it's six or seven years into this policy, you've got 200,000 in cash value. You've got $3 million in death benefit. Well, you go and borrow $80,000 from your policy. And then what the insurance company does, they don't actually remove your $200,000 from growing. You continue to earn on that dollar each and every day. What they do is they slap a first position lien on that death benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm following. Okay. So then what happens is if you have a bad day and you're out hunting in the jungle somewhere and you get hit by a blow dart, your beneficiary is not going, because again, it's a prepayment of death benefit. Your cash value is growing to one day meet the death benefit. And so at age 121, so if you can imagine, if you're, if you're seeing here, when you initially, if this is your cash value and you send that initial death benefit or that initial base premium to death benefit to purchase this, Every single at age 121, this cash value is contractually guaranteed to meet uh, the death benefit at age 121. So every year you make deposits, it pumps this death benefit number up. And so what happens is over time, this cash value has to contractually meet it. So the growth of your dollar inside of these policies are never going to stop growing. But what happens is when you borrow from the policy, you borrow from the cash value, they slap a lien on your death benefit. And again, if you if you happen to get hit by a bus, your beneficiary is not going to get all three million. They're going to get three million subtracting out the policy loan and then whatever's left your beneficiary would get. Does that make sense? It does. OK, so that's basically how it works. And so it's okay. it's, it's nothing more than just a line of credit that you own and control. We're just using life insurance as the vehicle. OK. And so this is really, um, so how much do you need to get started or how little can you start with? You can, you can start, I mean, here's the difference. Here's what I kind of tell people is 
you don't, there's no, there's no ceiling and there's no floor as to how big or how little that you want to go. But every okay. policy is constructed the same way. So again, in this $20,000 example, the $20,000 is the ceiling in this policy. So you made a $20,000 deposit. Next year, you guys have a home run year and you guys make $10 million. Well, this policy, you can't go, you can't go say, I want to go put 500,000 in this policy because you'd hop over the mech line. So this policy, the size, this is why my wife and I have a total of four policies is because we started where we could start. And then as our assets and our cash flow grew, we have found a need to go park money in these policies. So we just started a second policy and we started a third policy. So you build your pool of capital bigger and bigger each, each time you start a new policy, but this policy, you start, how, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So how accessible is the funds once you. You can get, you can get a hold. I mean, two weeks later, if you need it, two days later, I mean, a year later, what what's you would do. Is, what's, what the, you would, what's the, what's um, the, I guess the penalty. No penalty. There's no penalty. So what you, you have no penalty there. The only so the borrowing aspect, right. Is kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. You're borrowing, you're borrowing money. So it's, it's essentially quote unquote, like it's not a taxable event. That's how these things grow tax free we're never actually withdrawing capital from the policy. We're just borrowing from the policy. So <clears throat> like again, Could real estate be one of those. What do you mean? Could I use funds if it got to a certain point? to use to purchase real estate oh my god dude i do that like every day of the week 100 percent. so if you couple this with real estate investing it, it's like the dynamic superpower duo i mean they okay. literally go hand in hand with each other because i mean if you're flipping property or you uh i mean you're like i'll, I'll show you what i do exactly actually so i purchased That's what i was kind of thinking right now like i said i'm sorry starting from scratch but yeah. if i can get the policy up to a certain amount and get it compounding then even if it's five years from now, if I could start using this policy to borrow against, well, so what is this? No, you're you're hundred percent on. So I, I was just going to show you how I use my own policy. Like, okay, I use my policies because again, this I couple this with real estate because candidly, man, real estate is my game. Uh, I just teach infinite banking as a coupler with real estate because it's it's enhancing and changed my life. I just love showing other people how to use it too. So okay. So what I do is I am, my life insurance policy is the lender. My business is the borrower. And this is yes. a property This is a property that I purchased in Kokomo, Indiana, where I was born and raised. And I bought it for 44 grand. So what I did is I am charging myself interest of 5% because I went down to my local community bank and I said, hey, uh, if I was to borrow- I'm liking this, grand, like where this is going. Yeah. If I was to borrow 44,000 from you, how much would you charge me? He's like 5%. I said, okay, cool. I will now borrow money from myself and I will be the bank. I will charge myself that rate of interest. Yeah. And I will pay myself back each and every month for 60 months amortized. So every and month- this is an official I'm, note. This is a note. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to end up saying like, this is like notarized and, and recorded at the courthouse. Right, right, this right. Is between me and my business- because I want to treat your... my money with respect. And yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, you know, that's, and how am I supposed to teach people how to use this if I don't do it myself, you know? Right. Okay. So, so if you can see kind of how that works, but more importantly, the whole goal is I'm the one controlling this cash flow. I don't just earn the cash flow from the real estate. I don't just earn the depreciation. I earn the appreciation. But more importantly, that interest, you can see over 60 months, $5,820, which doesn't sound like a big number. It's really not. But imagine if this was like half a million dollars and all the interest that would have gone to a lending institution. But in reality, it's going back to me. I control okay. that cash flow. I control and earn that interest. And all the while, my capital was still growing in my policy as if it never left. I was earning right. on both sides of the coin. Okay. So this is what I'm trying goal. to do. I'm starting from scratch. Like I said, I just started my brokerage, officially got sure. out. I don't, like, I don't even have a pipeline yet. Uh, I've got two agents joining me. In the next 30 days um and it, we're just gonna hit the ground running with that nice um so i'm starting to figure out you know structure and you know my business stuff like just how i can structure the business and then how i can take the excess capital and maybe take some of that and reinvest it into assets down payments for assets yeah. or take some of the uh, additional funds to an account like this um 
to be honest, to be frank with you, I've gotten to a point I actually have zero expenses. Um, yeah, and so I met a basically a wash where, you know, I've got no, no uh, debt, but uh, I've got no capital right now either. So any capital that starts coming in from the business transactionally is going to be a lot more than what I'm going to need to live off of. Yeah. Um, and go, man. so I'm going to have thousands yeah. to do stuff with because um, average transaction is going to be like 5k even if I say it's 4k on the conservative side uh, if we start running three four deals a, a month you know it's 12 15k coming in that again my burn rate's not even close to a thousand so wow um, yeah I'm trying to and then of course I have the two agents will be giving me a cut from their deals but I'm going to help them get into production as well so I'll take some of those proceeds and divvy those off maybe into an account like this. So just, you know, this is where I'm at. So I don't, what would you recommend or how can I get this set up and just kind of pull the trigger on it? Yeah. Well, here's what we do is, so like, like I mentioned before, like, like I said, that number was split into two. So the way you start a policy, again, there's a couple of ways that you can fund it. Like, let's just use that 20,000 for an example. You can cut a check out of the gate for $20,000 and you know you've got immediate access to 12 because the 8,000 buys death benefit. I mean, you got a little kiddo having that box to check. It's a nice box to check. Uh, we don't do it for that, but that's, you know, it is what it is. But or you can what you can do is you can turn the base premium on as a monthly draw for 12 months because of the illiquidity. And each month you just have an auto draw of 667 because that's, again, 8,000 over 12 months. And then you can just dump in the $12,000 at a later date, whenever you want, drop it in. When you, something comes up, bam, you borrow it out whenever you need to. And so that would be the way that you would, in the, and then the first year, like I mentioned, so let me just explain how like quickly your cash value accumulates. So in the very first year, you've only got access to that 12, but when you make another deposit next year of 20,000, your cash value goes from 12 to $32,000. So the cost of insurance is completely gone after year one. Does that make sense? We're not, we don't have to worry about sending money to, to, to base premium anymore. It's simply going dollar for dollar to cash value. So the, the minimum base premium, what you're saying is 8,000 a year? Correct, correct. So 8, you- 8,000 a year. 8,000, well, no. So I'm saying like in the very first year, you just have the illiquidity of that 8,000. The next year when you drop in the 20, which is again, the cash value and the base premium, all those dollars go to cash value. So like you don't have to, you're, you're buying more death benefit, but it doesn't cost you in regards to illiquidity at that point. I'm sorry. So um, what I'm understanding you say is the initial 8,000. Give me just a minute, man. I apologize. Right, no big deal. No big deal. <laughs> I'm going to. All right, man. Sorry about that. I'm back. Um, so my hard cash investment is $8,000. That after year one gets me 12,000 in death benefits, which is what I'm seeing. You're adding together to give a, an account value of 20,000. But that's not my cash value if I were to take that out. Want me to show you what like a policy would look like? Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, let's do that real quick. So here is, I think we know her. So you can see there's a lot of numbers happening here, but I just yeah. want to focus on these two columns that are highlighted, the cash okay. outlay and the cash value, okay? So in year one, she's depositing $55,000 in her cash value because 55,000, that's split into two numbers, 22,000 and 33,000 to equal 55,000. So her cash value is $34,000 in year one because the 22 went to go by $1.6 million of death benefit. Does that make sense? Okay. That's the illiquidity. The next year, she drops another 55,000 in. Her cash value goes up to $85,000. So she's literally almost dollar for dollar 
in regards to she had to send a little bit of money to, to some more death benefit because you can see it went from 1.6 to 1.7 so there was mm -hmm. a little bit of cost but at the end of the day uh she's almost completely liquid the very the very next year and so you can see after 10 years um she's put in 451 she's got 494 so she's made forty three thousand dollars in simply a business checking account this isn't even an investment it's just where we're keeping our liquid dollars and so yeah, one more time she so she's invested at this point how many her deposits if you look down here in this cash outlay column uh -huh. her deposits for 10 years have been equal to four hundred and fifty one thousand dollars okay her cash value has grown because now she's compounding on a bigger number each and every year as this goes on after 10 years she's got in capital in access or liquidity 494 342 which is a 400 or a forty three thousand dollar net gain uh in her policy and so okay after 10 years after 10 years right and so you look at this and again this is you would say man 43 grand that i've only made all my money over 10 years doesn't seem like a lot and really it's it's not a lot in regards to an investment account but this isn't an investment this is just where we keep our safe liquid dollars it's like our business working capital account and where you, most of the time i mean again i don't i hope that you got a bank that's making you more than you know, but nobody's making, you're not making $65,000, $70,000 in a business checking account right now with basis points being where they are because you got to pay taxes on that. This is tax free. So okay. that's the difference there too. You'd have to make $70,000 in the checking account, pay tax on that, and then just to net $43,000. It's just not going to happen. And then also, too, I'd ask you this question if you put in $450 and you've got $494, how much does this death benefit cost you at that point? So that death benefit, how does that work? Is it something that, let's just say at age 44, I end up passing? Um, age 44, you pass, you're insured, you're, I mean, you're, you're, the death benefit's going to be $2.4878 million less the, the cash value. So about $2 million. Why less the cash value? So look all the if way down, here. Let's, let's scroll all the way down to the bottom of this. Again, it goes down to your one age 121. 12.726, 12.726. Uh, so the cash value, like I mentioned earlier, is trying to catch up and meet the death benefit. And so the cash value grows inside of the death benefit. Each year that you make a new deposit into the policy, it essentially is freeing up more of the death benefit in the form of equity. Does that make sense? Okay. I know I'm kind of throwing a lot at you. It's drinking out of a fire hose. I apologize. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand. So the trade-off is I get a payout, a large payout with only contributing the 450. Correct. Uh, yeah. For my daughter, for instance. Correct. And and also too, V, you don't even after seven years, you don't you can stop contributing to this if you wanted to. You you could just turn this policy off and you'd have every dollar that you put into it. And then your death benefit will be permanent for the rest of your life. You can't outlive it. Okay. So let's look at these same numbers. Okay. So each 44 cash value, 494 in the account. I've got death benefits of 2.4 million. Yep. Now, where does the borrowing, if I wanted to purchase an asset like the other thing you just showed me, right? Let's just yep. change that number. Let's just say it's a, um, you know, a million dollar property. Sure. That I'm wanting to contract on. How does that play out with this scenario? So I would first encourage you to borrow 750 from the bank, take on some leverage with the bank. But then I would say if you've got in year 10, you're 44, you find a million dollar deal, you're gonna you're gonna need 250 grand. I would say borrow $250,000 from this policy, from your cash value. And then okay. I would just fill my, but as the cash flow from that property comes in, just have uh, that fill up your bucket because again, what's happening is the two hundred fifty thousand. So let me just show you here. Like, if you were to do two hundred fifty thousand dollars, what they're going to do right here, they're, they're just going to deduct it from the death benefit and yep, the cash value, right? They're going to do this. A the lien, right? That's right. They're going to put a lien on your death benefit. That's what they'll do. Okay. And okay. so your cash value is still accumulating and growing. It's not, that growth is not being interrupted. That's kind of what makes, ah, the, I see. That's what okay. makes it work makes so sense. well. Is that's, this, that's what I was trying to figure out. Yeah. You're using the insurance company's money. You're not using your own money. 
Gotcha. So your dollar just keeps on growing. And, and like at the end of the day, your cash value is, you know, you fill the bucket back up with cash flow over the time. Like your dollar, your, your equity will be here contractually guaranteed at age 54. You will have deposit. So yeah. That's with these deposits going in though, of 22,000 when the outlay, right? Correct. Okay. But so let's, uh, if you don't mind, go back to that one point. So let's just say if we, again, you use the same 44. If I stopped investing into this account at 44, um, what does that cash value growth look like from 44 to 54? Does it still hit that 1.1 1. 1 million mark? No, or? it's going to be a little bit less. Let me show right. you how that one pulled up. Because that's several hundred. I, I mean, I think it's at least like, what, $200,000. I'm not contributing that year. Yeah, yeah. So for that 10-year period. Here's a policy where she turned it off. She didn't pay into it again. Okay. And so you can see right here at your, your age 45, you've deposited 451. You've got mm -hmm. 494, the same number before. You have $43,000 more. And then you don't pay another dime into this for the rest of your life. You've now okay. got one and a half million dollars of, of death benefit that you cannot outlive. And then this just grows. Again, you go from 494 to 792. You didn't take on any risk and you didn't pay any taxes on this on this growth. So is that the cash value? This is cash value. So how is that cash value growing if I stop contributing? Because remember, the cash value has to catch up to the death benefit. It's contractually obligated to. Oh, that's right. It's right. Yeah, okay. so it's growing no matter what. Over the 121 period. It goes all the way down here. So you can see it's going to 8.2 million. They're, they're meeting at 8.2 million. So, so the contractual obligation is based off of a 121 year period. Correct. Period that has to. Yep. Okay. Exactly. And is it like speed up or is it like interest in the sense of like interest loans, you know, they're front loaded with heavy, um, you know, monthly payments going towards that interest versus the principal. In this situation, is it geared similarly where the growth is not as exponential in the earlier, you know, third of the cycle? Whereas the last third, maybe a rapid increase in that catch up process. Uh, it's close. You're, you're, it's, I see where your head is. It's almost a little bit different. So what, so <clears throat> look at it from this standpoint. So the 55,000, remember when I said that was split into two numbers and you okay. added this, that it was called the flexible paid up rider. And that's your cash value in year one. The thing okay. is, is that cash, that flexible paid up rider essentially goes to buy more death benefit. And what I mean is, but it doesn't cost you any money because you have cash value. So every year okay. that you place, so you notice something here. Look at this, V. In the very first year, you have 1.6 million death benefit. You put the rider again, it goes to 1.7. You put the rider again, it goes to 1.8. It keeps, it's going up about $100,000 a year, right? Okay. Look what happens to the death benefit when you drop the rider off. It goes from 2.39 to 2.41. So the, the rider is the fuel added to the fire to increase the death benefit. So the more rider that we put in this thing, the higher it's forcing that death benefit up, which forces that cash value to hockey stick even more. So for having a kid, this is a guarantee. This is a, it's a slam dunk. It's a no brainer. Pretty, pretty small Mark, knowing that you're going to have to, you're going to die eventually. I mean, might as well be a policy that you have that cashes yeah. my daughter out with, and that's how that works, right? Yeah, I mean, look when you're 90 years old, man. I mean, you put in 451 when you actually are about to graduate into the next life. And I mean, this is, I mean, look at this, $4.3 million tax-free to your beneficiary one day. So to my daughter, she'd be able to have that, no taxes. No taxes. It just goes to her, right. And it goes okay. to her within like a week. And, okay. and this will be the time when you actually are going to want to that, have that death benefit one day. Like it's not important right now because we're young and we're healthy. Well, yeah, right this, that's the whole thing right now is um, that's why I was like, can I get this account set up? So the annual contribution I'm looking at is $8,000. Okay. Is that correct? So that's your, so like the $8,000 would be what's going to death benefit. Like again, that $20,000 number. So we go back to this really quickly. This tw like in the very first year, you've got to make a total. If we were using this example, You've got to make a total deposit of $20,000. The 8,000 okay. is the only amount that's illiquid in year one. The 12,000 is liquid. This $20,000 number, is that, where, where can you start if you're not starting at 20,000? You can start anywhere that you want. You could do 500,000 a year if you wanted to. 
There's no, it's the rich man's Roth. You, you do how much a year? You could do a million dollars a year if you wanted to. There's, we've, I mean, you can do any amount that you want. There's literally no limit. But, okay, but what's the entry point though? The entry point is just in the very first year, it's this number. You've got to hit this number. That's, okay, that's, what, that's, that's what I'm asking. So it has to be 20,000 correct for this to make sense correct well i mean you could if the entry point you could do a thousand bucks a year if you wanted to i wouldn't encourage that because your cash value would be 600 bucks and you wouldn't be able to really utilize it that well it wouldn't really do anything and you probably buy it would probably buy you like twenty thousand dollars of death benefit and it would only compound i mean just be a small number i mean the entry point is whatever you want it to be but that, but this can, number, you, can you scale once you let's just say you with that scenario you started at the thousand dollar entry point right um could you scale that up you know in the coming months or maybe beginning of the next year once you set this contract in place so like again you make let's say you make one deposit of the 667 you are now putting this particular policy in force and so the max that you can fund that one policy would be 20,000. Because once you, because remember, if you were to next year, you have a, a home run year and you <clears> wanted <throat> to put 25 grand into it. Remember, we ran this policy so hot to that mech line, you'd hop over it. It'd be taxable. So, okay. So the $20,000 um, is just this is ratio. The mech line. Correct. No, 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 no. Not the 20 grand. It's just the ratio between the FPUR, the flexible paid up rider and the base premium. Because, so what I'm saying is if this was $50,000, your cash value in year one would be 30 and your base premium would be 20. Okay. So but it's I'm still maxed out at contributing 20, right? Correct. Because that's where the line is. Okay. Yeah. So um, every policy that you, if you wanted to run more numbers on this, Every yeah. amount or total dollar amount, split it into two, 60 and 40. And your liquidity okay. is 60% and your illiquidity or the death benefit that you're purchasing is 40%. So if I invested $1,000, I would have a $600 cash value with a $400 um, out to purchase death benefits in that amount. That's correct. That's for, exactly for, that, for that, what what term is it on? annual uh, monthly like. you could do any way that you want you could write a check for a thousand bucks and just be done with it for the whole year or you can turn it on for you know 67 dollars a month or, or i don't even know what that number would be i mean 600 bucks yeah. a year or whatever you know whatever it would be right yeah because i could always add up to the twenty thousand dollar threshold that twenty thousand dollars set in the cap well i was just yeah, using twenty thousand as that as a as a as an example so if oh, you using I set the cap when I invest. Do I set the cap based off the initial amount I invest? You do. You set the cap in that first year. Okay. Yep. Okay. So then that's why where multiple policies come into play, where you set this policy at twenty, and then you're like, damn, well, we 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 had a home run year. Let's start another policy at forty, and then you start building okay. a pool of capital bigger that way. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. What if I wanted to? start a policy at, um, like I said, somewhere in between like 5,000. You could do it. it, okay. it just, you wouldn't really be able to utilize it well though, candidly. If you were well, starting- that's fine. I'm thinking more so just to kind of get started, sure. just to have the account, have the kind of the habit of like, okay, this is where it's going. Yeah. But then get crossing over to the other point where it's like, okay, now it's starting to actually gain some cash value or now it's going to start to actually, you know, and that'll be another resource I can tap into and then really fuel the growth from there. Down the road. Yeah. But, no, so how, how would I go about that? So what we'll do is, I mean, if you're, if it doesn't cost you anything, doesn't bind you anything and can't, it doesn't even bind the insurance company to insuring you, but you got to get a health rating and that's going to be what's going to be next. And it's, it's basically just filling out some information about yourself, sure. your lifestyle, um, sure. where you were born, you know, do you skydive like questions like that? Okay. And so that, that'll be the next step. If I can, I can text that link to you or email it to you Perfect. and fill it out of your leisure. And then we'll just knock that out and we'll hear back from them in a couple of weeks. And then we'll get okay. another call and construct a policy together. Okay. Is there anything that I should know about that, you know, they don't like, I know technicality wise on the, I would say if I lose you, it's because my zoom has like less than one minute, but 
That's if you are a smoker, tell me you're not a smoker. That kind of stuff. You gotcha. Know I mean? Yeah. I gotcha. No, not a problem, man. Okay. Well, hey, appreciate your time, Nolan. Uh, awesome, looking forward man. to it. Nice to meet you, V. I'll send that stuff to you now. Appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Bye. Yeah.